Hey, welcome or welcome back. Our next presenter is Mary Harvey, who worked on a project with her advisor, Dr. Kathleen Wilburn. The title of the project is The 12 Step Conundrum, Defending the Acceptance of the 12 Step Model in Corporate Employee Assistance Programs. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Mary. Thank you so much. All right, sorry, there we go. Um, let me start this slideshow. All right, there we go. Uh, so yeah, my name is Mary Harvey. Thank you so much for introducing me. And yes, um, I worked with Dr. Kathleen Wilburn on this project and the title again is the 12 step conundrum defending acceptance of the 12 step model in corporate employee assistance programs. Sorry, let me just make sure I have this thing out of the way. There we go. So corporate social responsibility or CSR is rapidly becoming a consideration of all corporations and a key element of CSR is meeting the health needs of employees, both medical and emotional. We are seeing many corporations add addiction support programs for their employees. In this paper, we'll study support programs from seven individual corporations. We posit that the value of the 12 steps in the AA model is as effective or more effective than other treatment models, such as dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and a personal therapy and experiential therapy. Because of the 12-step model's effectiveness and markedly lower cost requirement, there is no fee for AA or other 12-step membership. This paper will recommend that the 12-step model be added to and or encouraged by more corporations' employee assistance programs, known as EAPs. This paper will address several challenges the 12-step model has faced in achieving widespread acceptance, particularly in the public and medical spheres. The strongest challenge is resistance to the spiritual focus of the 12 steps. Um, so some of the terms that I've just mentioned um, include Alcoholics Anonymous, which is commonly known as AA. Uh, that is an organization that was founded in the 1930s by two alcoholics. Um, it is a non-professional peer-to-peer support organization um, and is now grown to include several million members. Um, the 12 steps is the program that is recommended in um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, the group follows their text, which is called the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, the 12-step program is explicitly spiritual, given the proponents argue that alcoholics are unable to help themselves, thus they need to turn to something greater than themselves for help. 12-step um, fellowships refer to Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, and other organizations that use the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous as their primary text and promote the working of the 12 steps. And these include AA, as I mentioned, and also Cocaine Anonymous and other groups. Um, so to introduce us to the, the issue of substance abuse in the United States, um, the cost of substance abuse as of 2016 um, was $578 billion in economic costs. Um, this cost has since risen. Um, and as you can see on the chart, um, more than half of that cost comes from lost productivity costs. Um, so the cost of the employer is an estimated $120 billion in workplace productivity um, solely because of workers' substance abuse. And in the term substance abuse, um, alcohol is included as a mind-altering chemical. Um, the National Council on Alcoholism estimates that each alcoholic on the payroll costs the employer a minimum of one quarter of his or her annual salary. Um, so corporate social responsi responsibility, CSR, um, has been rising in popularity to where it's nearly ubiquitous. Um, and a, a big part of that is the employee assistance program. Um, employee assistance programs, or EAPs, were originally formed um, as occupational alcohol programs um, to help employees struggling with alcoholism. They have since been brought in to include a much wider range of mental illnesses and struggles, personal struggles. Um, additionally, they've changed from originally being internally run organizations to now they are commonly externally contracted. Um, so what that looks like is there's more distance today between the employee that is seeking help or being you know, forced to seek help and the individual that is referring uh, treatment options in the EAP. Um, so again, the role of the EAP is um, 
pretty critical in this situation. Um, they are uniquely positioned to provide help here. Um, and there's an enormous opportunity for them to provide early intervention and you know, potentially prevent some of these vast economic costs. Um, so some of the primary clinical treatment modal modalities that an EAP may refer to include cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, um, which challenges irrational thoughts and thought patterns, um, which can lead to relapse, uh, DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy, which was originally designed for board borderline personality disorder, which um, is a specific type of CBT that stresses um, distress tolerance and emotion regulation. Um, a third is motivational enhancement therapy or MET, which is an intervention approach for evoking change. Um, and the aim there is to get an individual from perhaps the pre-contemplation stage of changing their substance abuse habits to action and ideally to the maintenance of recovery. Um, another option that is also evidence-based is 12-step facilitation therapy or TSF therapy. Um, so in TSF therapy, a licensed therapist will work with an individual to actively promote their involvement in a 12-step fellowship of which Alcoholics Anonymous is one. Um, so it's, it's more than simply mentioning AA as a possibility. Um, it involves discussing the principles of AA and working with an individual to, again, help them to become fully integrated. Um, so looking at the effectiveness of these various treatment modalities, um, a 2020 meta-analysis of um, studies of the effectiveness of TSF therapy um, found that TSF interventions most often produced increased rates of continuous abstinence of large magnitude compared to interventions such as CBT and MET, again, cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational enhancement therapy, which many people have considered to be state-of-the-art behavioral interventions for alcohol use disorder. <clears throat> Um, turning to the cost effectiveness of these various treatment modalities, um, <clears throat> in economic terms, the same meta analysis found that um, sizable benefits in favor of TSF therapy compared to outpatient and CBT interventions of over $10,000 in mental health and substance use related healthcare costs per patient over the next two years. Um, kind of the basis for this is that when a patient attends um, a TSF-based treatment center, they're much more likely to become involved in 12-step fellowships afterwards um, because 12-step fellowships are by nature free. Um, this represents a reduction in cost long-term. Um, when you compare this to a patient that attends a non-TSF treatment where they are, again, less likely to be involved in 12-step fellowships afterwards and instead would turn to clinical visits, which are not free, therefore more expensive in the long-term. Um, there has been an upsurge in resistance to the 12 steps to alcoholism or to Alcoholics Anonymous and to TSF therapy. Um, Dr. Keith Humphreys, who's a researcher at Stanford, describes this as um, a posh view of anti-AA that has popped up in the last five years or so um, with some pretty negative things and a lot of people claiming it has no evidence of working. Um, he also cites a perception among some in the psychiatry community that AA, quote, trods on their professional turf and that members of AA provide similar talk therapy services without any degrees, medications, or payment. Um, resistance to spiritual modalities of treatment is not new. Um, approaches linked to particular religions have always raised concerns of generalizability and political issues if funded publicly, at least in the U.S. Um, so in my um, analysis and my um, research, I look to see if this was confirmed, um, this resistance to spiritual modalities um, and to TSF in corporate EAPs. And what I found was um, essentially, yes, um, that um, when I surveyed these different companies, what I found was that um, only one of them did include um, TSF therapy in their EAP. Um, and when I asked them about collecting data, showing the effectiveness of various therapy approaches, none of them said that they do definitively do that. Many cited um, a uh, concern of confidentiality. Um, however, I did find that um, most of the people surveyed um, did say that they would be interested in promoting TSF therapy over other forms upon learning of the significant cost advantages. Um, I also asked if the spiritual focus of the 12 steps and associated fellowships 
caused hesitation. About half said that it did. Um, and of those that said that it did cause hesitation, um, I asked them what that hesitation was primarily based on. Um, about half said legal issues and the other half regulatory issues. Um, so some of the takeaways of this research of the corporate side of things, um, individuals in corporate HR and EAP uh, programs, um, the primary concern was legal considerations due to the religious connotations of TSF therapy. Um, we also found generally a positive reaction um, towards the idea of inclusion of TSF therapy. Um, again, that one company that did include um, TSF therapy was the North Carolina Lawyer Assistance Program, and they were very positive about it and said that they only refer to TSF therapy treatment. Um, on the other hand, um, those that we spoke to individually about um, their program were positive about the idea, although they don't currently include it. Um, we also found a general lack of awareness of TSF therapy's cost effectiveness and a lack of awareness of TSF therapy's effectiveness in general. Um, so on the recovery side, I um, again surveyed a um, number of leaders in the Austin recovery community. Those would be um, CEOs of uh, local recovery treatment centers. Um, and what I found was primarily a feeling of um, among them, of rejection by scientific and professional communities. Um, they generally found that the more scientific the community, the less likely they were to favor a TSF model as opposed to a traditional medical model such as CBT or DBT. <clears throat> they also found that a prevalent stigma of AA as old fashioned out of date treatment for those who cannot afford something better. Um, they also found resistance from insurance companies to cover TSF treatment, stating insurance companies are definitely frowning on 12 step and supporting CBT, DBT over the 12 steps. Um, of note, one of the um, recovery professionals surveyed did mention that state bar associations were kind of the exception to the norm here in terms of awareness and acceptance of TSF therapy, um, which aligns with our finding that um, the one company that did actively have TSF therapy was a lawyer assistance program in North Carolina. Um, Another key takeaway was the effectiveness of TSF therapy as a precursor to other therapies. So with this, none of the recovery professionals I surveyed um, had any disinclination towards uh, CBT, TBT, or other clinical therapies, but with the caveat that they felt that those other therapies are only effective when they are conducted after TSF therapy or at the same time as TSF therapy. Um, they explained this as, um, kind of the groundwork of TSF therapy, which provides stability they feel is needed in order for these other therapies to truly be effective, um, especially because many of these other therapies can be intense trauma work. Um, and if someone is in and out of sobriety, it's very difficult to um, effectively work through that. Um, third was a belief in TSF therapy's effectiveness. Um, this was felt very strongly by those I spoke with. Um, and fourth was, um, some concern about the effect of AA's nature and some of its traditions on its ability to counteract potential societal misrepresentations of AA. Um, a particular societal misrepresentation they felt was the perception of AA as a religious group. Um, AA identifies itself as spiritual and not religious. However, um, many conflate those two together. Um, so the role of the medical community in corporate EAPs um, so corporations generally rely on, um, you know, they're generally outsourced EAP to create these substance abuse policies, and these EAPs take their cues from the medical community at large. So when the medical community um, is generally emphasizing, you know, one therapy over another, that has a large influence on these EAPs. Um, so what we found is that currently there is a, an emphasis on um, CBT, DBT, which are these neurobiological and psychopharmacological modalities over spiritual modalities such as TSF. In fact, they stated 12-step facilitation therapy and 12-step recovery overall are at risk of becoming dying arts. So our recommendations were, number one, to clarify what 12-step facilitation therapy is and what it is not. Um, it is a form of therapy that is conducted by a licensed therapist. Um, it is not conducted by AA itself. Um, also to promote a 21st century understanding of spirituality, a 2017 Pew Research poll found that a growing number of Americans 
um, identify as spiritual but not religious, um, showing that a number of people um, are seeing these two things, spirituality and religion, as separate entities. Um, three, to emphasize TSF's uh, clinical success and economic advantages, particularly in long-term care. Um, and four, to underscore the extent of societal changes in the past century and the importance of adapting to these changes. Um, in particular, uh, this kind of goes for both sides, um, the recovery side and the corporate side. On the recovery side, traditionally, their form of outreach has been through hospitals and religious organizations to reach suffering individuals. Um, and um, in today's world, that's not quite as effective because an individual is probably more easily reached through their employer as opposed to a religious organization. Um, so on the recovery side, for perhaps a change in their form of outreach and on the corporate side, um, an open mind toward this possibility of a partnership between employers and 12-step advocates. Um, and that is everything and thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mary, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm going to first turn things over to um, Professor Wilbur in case you'd like to say a few words about working on this project with you. Um, and Asking me to help you. I think this is uh, fascinating research. It obviously is going to be added to my CSR courses and so <laughs> what you've done is really added to my um, my <clears throat> my own understanding too and um i think the topic was excellent because it makes a difference in today's world and um excellent research excellent presentation so thank you very much thank you dr wilburn thank you both so much um this is normally where dr wilburn would get to give mary her honor stole we can't do that today but mary it is in the mail if you haven't gotten it already <laughs> so i hope you can wear it uh, to celebrate and do something fun. But thank you both so much. Um, we do have time for questions. If you have any questions for Mary, if you could type them into the chat, that would be wonderful. Um, we'll give everyone a minute to formulate their questions. And uh, I wonder if in the meantime, Mary, you might tell us a little bit about how you came to this as your senior thesis topic. Sure. Um, so I have worked in the recovery field for about, uh, a year and a half now um, and I'm also a finance major so I was hoping to find kind of an intersect between those two things um, so when I talked to Dr. Wilburn she mentioned CSR and from there um, I just kind of went into this world of EAPs that I didn't know existed um, and looking into how um, EAPs and 12-step recovery which I'm a part of intersect or in this case how they don't um, so that's It's really fascinating. And um, I'm going to jump in and ask one more question because um, people haven't, uh, I'm going to hog the floor a little bit since we don't have any yet. Do you have any hypothesis about why it is that it was bar associations and lawyer organizations that are more open to this? Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I would just kind of be calling upon um, I guess some stereotypes. I know like in my own family, there's a number of lawyers and they are in recovery. So it wasn't the most shocking thing to me, but again, that's more drawing on, you know, my own experience. Um, additionally, the, the um, owners of a number of treatment centers in the area are uh, former attorneys themselves. So I'm not really sure, um, you know, perhaps the stress level of that type of work um, things like that can, you know, increase someone's chance of becoming addicted to a substance. Um, but as to why they're more prone to 12-step as opposed to another form of therapy, I don't know. That's a really good question. I thought that was just, it was a really fascinating presentation on the whole, and I thought that finding um, was, was particularly fascinating. But um, we have time for a few questions. Um, and um, if there aren't more questions for Mary, um, we can transition um, into our transition time. Um, 
but I hope you'll join me in, in just telling Mary what an excellent job she did. Um, that was really, really fascinating and wonderful. And thank you so much to Professor Wilburn for um, supporting Mary for this project. I, we all learned a whole lot. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, you got you have you have, don't have a question, but you do have a comment. It is great job, um, and that you did. So, um, everyone else, um, thank you so much for being here. We have five minutes as usual to transition. It was perfect.